slightly late. The best thing to do would be to start with the first uh, panel discussion, which is uh, a discussion of the currently uh, activated criminal code revision. The chairman of the panel is Mark Shant from the University of Iowa Law School. And Mark, you introduce your panelists, and I'll sit down. Thank you, John. <coughs> Happy to uh, be here on uh, uh, this morning. Sorry, we're getting a little bit of a late start. That's partly my fault. I directed uh, all my panelists to the Holiday Inn. <laughs> we, they, they all managed to, uh, to find their way, which ought to test to how alert they'll be this morning. Uh, let me make a few uh, uh, quick introductions. Uh, all of these gentlemen have had a substantial input into uh, the preparation of this uh, proposed uh, new criminal code. On my immediate right is Judge Donato uh, from Des Moines, who is representing the judicial branch in the committee. On my far right is a person familiar to many of you, I'm sure, uh, Norman Jesse, who's a lawyer in Des Moines and a state representative. Um, in the middle is uh, Professor John Yeager from uh, the Drake University Law School, who was uh, principal uh, draftsman of several major portions of it. Uh, on my left is Professor Ron Carlson from a colleague at the University of Iowa Law School, who also uh, did a good bit of the uh, initial drafting. Uh, and on his left, is his, uh, his man Friday, Don Tim, a, uh, a third year law student at the uh, uh, University of Iowa. Uh, Professor Josephine Gittler, who had hoped to be here, was uh, unable to come because of uh, illness in her family. The, the subject of the panel this morning is this, this bill. Uh, I think back in September of 69, uh, work was begun on a uh, comprehensive uh, revision of the uh, Iowa Criminal Code, something that uh, really had not ever happened. Uh, and uh, uh, many of the current provisions date, I think it is, to uh, 1854. Uh, so it was uh, high time and uh, indeed a uh, massive task. Uh, the committee has now completed its work, which is memorialized in this uh, now in this 233-page bill, which I understand to be the, the largest one ever introduced in the uh, in the Iowa legislature, and it constitutes, I think, uh, a systematic reworking of the of the law of crimes, uh, of law of criminal procedure, <coughs> and of the sentencing uh, and corrections uh, statutes. My understanding is that the bill is now in the Judiciary Committees in both branches of the, uh, of the legislature, and it is now expected that it will come to the floor uh, sometime the next, um, next session. The just no question that this was clearly a job that uh, needed doing, and I think uh, uh, there's a great deal here that the, uh, the ICLU could and should support. There are probably also a number of provisions uh, about which many of us would have some concern. Uh, doubtless we'll uh, spend a little more time on that uh, than on the, uh, uh, that which we like. But uh, the, I do want to uh, stress the, the magnitude and the importance of the, uh, the undertaking. And I think we are uh, fortunate today to have the, <coughs> the observations and explanations of those who have uh, participated in the uh, drafting process. I thought a uh, uh, useful format might be to, to spend a few minutes at the beginning uh, going in a little bit to the background and, and the philosophy uh, that underlay the, uh, the drafting process. Uh, then I thought we might turn to a few specific topics uh, that occurred to me as, as things that uh, this group would likely be concerned with, and then open up uh, the last third or so, or so for, an, or maybe more, for a, uh, 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 questions of all kinds from, uh, uh, from the audience. 
Uh, without any more from me, I would, uh, I think I would turn to uh, Professor Yeager for uh, some background comments. Thank you. As uh, has been suggested by Mr. Chance, uh, <clears throat> we have been working on this particular bill for about three years. This bill represents then the rather intensive work of uh, upward of a dozen men for this uh, rather extended period. Actually, some of us have been working on it a lot longer than that. I know it was back in 1963 when Judge Donato here, who has been one of the prime movers in this state for getting a revision of the criminal code, has uh, approached me and asked me if I would be interested in taking part in uh, this type of a project. And uh, off and on, for the last 10 years then, uh, we have been working on this. <coughs> but it's not been until 1969 that we really uh, got organized and um, <coughs> started producing effectively. Now the part of the code which I am most familiar with is the substantive code. That is that part of the code which defines what are crimes, what kind of acts that we are going to uh, indict people for and uh, possibly punish them for, and also that part of the crime which deals with the uh, treatment of convicted offenders. Um, Mr. Carlson uh, dealt with the procedural aspects of the uh, criminal code, <coughs> and uh, we'll talk to you about that. Now, uh, it would be impossible for me to summarize the uh, substantive portion of the criminal code in, the t in any reasonable time that might have been allotted to me at a meeting of this sort. So what I will do will be simply to give you an idea of what some of our basic assumptions were in putting this code together, and then if there are any particular parts of the code that any of you would like to talk about, I will be glad to discuss them in detail. We started off with some uh, basic assumptions here. <clears throat> the first was that uh, we should use the uh, criminal law rather sparingly in trying to control individual conduct. Only those acts that we cannot tolerate even assuming the possibility that the person who does these things can be made to pay for the damage that he causes, there are some types of things that we cannot tolerate, and uh, these are the types of things that we uh, could make criminal. For example, uh, certain offenses against personal security, your homicide laws, assault law, uh, sexual abuse laws, uh, kidnapping, all of these are a rather serious threat to a person's life or physical safety. Um, also, there are some things which I suppose we have to consider not quite such a serious threat, but nonetheless a threat uh, to a person's physical well-being, such as limitations on the use of x-ray equipment, uh, the type of thing you might not think of as, <coughs> as being uh, a crime as such, but it, is, it has been a crime in this state for many years to use these x-ray machines and fitting little children with shoes, for example. Um, we think it ought to be a little broader than just uh, legislation against the use of x-ray machines in shoe shops, uh, but we do think people need to be protected against the indiscriminate use of this type of machinery. Also, uh, um, Refrigerators. Now, what's dangerous about a refrigerator? Uh, nothing as long as it's sitting in somebody's kitchen and being used to store food. But when you leave the things set out uh, in a vacant lot, children play in them and they get um, um, trapped and uh, so forth. You know what the problem is, of course. <coughs> well, um, this is another threat to public safety, uh, personal safety, uh, which we uh, include in our criminal code. Um, and then there are some threats which you might not consider as uh, threats to personal safety. They're more, a, a, more threats to a person's emotional security, such as um, um, some types of, uh, of harassment, uh, obscene phone calls, that sort of thing. Um, 
certain types of uh, obscenity, I suppose, would be a threat to the, the general emotional security of the public. Um, lascivious acts with children is a pretty direct threat to the emotional security of the child. Sometimes this results in physical harm, but more often not. <clears throat> but these, uh, these uh, things we have included in the code as being the type of thing we cannot tolerate. Certain types of uh, property offenses, such as theft, um, willful damage and trespass, uh, burglary. And then there are some things which are really a mixture of, um, <coughs> of uh, threats to property and personality, such as robbery and uh, arson. And uh, then there are some threats which do not affect individuals directly, but which affect the state, its operation, and its security, such as insurrections, riots, bribery of uh, public officials, election frauds, uh, uh, misconduct in office, and uh, offenses of that sort. Now, generally, uh, the type of thing that we have considered to be criminal will fit into these categories. Uh, second, we deal only with malicious acts and with reckless acts. Um, the, um, the act itself uh, has to be proved. The uh, committee has resisted any proposal that persons uh, might be punished in some instances when they haven't done anything, although um, we've had some trouble with this. There are some cases where people are required by law to act and where failure to do so uh, should be considered criminal, such as a person uh, willfully refusing to feed his children or to uh, um, uh, protect these uh, children against known injuries. Uh, the, um, but generally speaking, you have to do something before you will be considered uh, to have committed a crime. <coughs> we had a lot of trouble with conspiracy in this respect, and I'm sure that almost anybody that's interested in civil liberties is very much interested in the crime of conspiracy. Because after all, a conspiracy consists of nothing more than a conversation between two people. And it's the nature of that conversation that makes it criminal. <coughs> and uh, then our second proposition is that these things have to be either malicious or reckless. Um, now, a malicious act is one which is done without justification and uh, which is done with the intent to cause some injury. A reckless act is one which is done with a uh, rather gross disregard for the welfare of other people. Uh, the function of the criminal code is to punish, basically, and uh, or to neutralize. Uh, it can be either to punish or to neutralize or to uh, reform criminals. And, uh, and uh, it is only the people who act willfully or recklessly who you can or need to either punish, neutralize, or reform. Um, the uh, third proposition here is that these crimes should be classified according to the seriousness of the threatened injury and according to the gravity of the threat. For example, we have uh, placed those acts which constitute a, a, a serious threat to the lives of persons or a serious threat of disability or, or grave injury to a person as being in the um, uh, category of the most serious crimes. Um, in the uh, second category of what we might call the middling uh, serious crimes are those which threaten uh, only a property loss of a rather substantial kind. Um, and in the third ca category, we have those acts which constitute a minor threat of some sort or, th uh, or threaten a rather minor loss. Now, these are generally your, um, your misdemeanors. Then our fourth proposition here is that we should deal only with those uh, crimes which, um, which have victims. The so-called victimless crime we have tried to steer clear of. We have not made drunkenness per se a crime. Uh, uh, there is no vagrancy provision in this code. Uh, even if we could constitutionally include one, we <laughs> chose not to do so. Um, we have had to compromise with this uh, proposition a little bit in that we still do um, 
deal with uh, prostitution and, and uh, professional gambling. And the reason that we have continued these is that uh, we, we realize that you don't just legalize professional gambling or decriminalize it, I guess is a better word. You don't just de decriminalize professional gambling. You don't just decriminalize prostitution like you might do some uh, drunkenness, for example. But you have to, at this, uh, when you decriminalize this type of activity, you also have to provide for some sort of a regulation of it, uh, much as we regulate the liquor industry. And we did not consider that it was within the scope of our committee's activities to go into such an extensive uh, um, uh, preparation of a, say, a, a legalized uh, gambling law or a legalized prostitution law or something like that. If the legislature chooses to do that, they can do that as a separate project, but not as part of this, uh, this code. And then the, the fifth, and I suppose really one of the most uh, uh, important as far as um, a revision of a code, which as uh, this one uh, does, does not attempt really to change the, uh, the law with respect to the kind of activity which will be considered criminal or to the kind of people who will be considered as criminals, but more to a change in the, um, in the phraseology of the, uh, of the code itself. We think that the uh, law should be stated in language which is as simple and easily understood as is possible. We expect everybody to obey the law and uh, therefore the law should be so stated that a person knows what it is he's supposed to do. Now we don't have to state it so clearly and uh, unequivocally that he knows just how close he can cut corners. That's not our, our uh, 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 task here. If he, he, if he wants to cut corners, he can go get expert advice and find out how to do it. But um, he, he should know generally what kind of things he can do and what kind of things he's not supposed to do. And also, uh, you, we have to keep in mind here that the first echelon of administration is your police officer. Uh, police officers who are not um, legally trained and who, uh, generally speaking, do not have the same kind of mentality that we would expect to find in, say, a Supreme Court justice. Um, these people have to be able to understand this law well enough to administer it. Um, and also, in connection with this, the code should be free from duplication and uh, internal contradictions. And um, our present code, I think, is replete with um, uh, duplication <coughs> and uh, internal contradictions. There are at least 30 and perhaps 60 different ways to steal property under the Iowa Code. Uh, we, we don't think that <coughs> you need that many different kinds of theft. Um, you can cover the same ground a lot more simply than that. Well, those uh, uh, are, uh, that, that basically is the uh, philosophy, or states the philosophy that we adopted in the uh, preparation of this code. If there's anything particular you would like to talk about, I'd be glad to do that. We'll, uh, we'll come back for some more. I'm sure that will prompt some questions, so thank you. Uh, Professor Carlson, any uh, general observations? I think John has covered uh, some of the basic philosophy of the code. I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about some of what I consider the highlight provisions in the portion that I was more closely connected with, the criminal procedure part, just perhaps to give um, the attendees the flavor of what's going on in uh, some of these specific provisions. Now, in the area of arrest, for example, uh, we've got to bring the law up to sort of modern conditions. Uh, one of the things that a law enforcement officer sometimes uh, confronts today are situations of riots or civil disturbances. Often to make a custody arrest in that situation will set off more violence uh, than is already there or maybe start violence which was not there in the first place. And so most of the commentators on the law of arrest say it's vital that the law enforcement officer have the ability to not make a custody arrest but rather to issue a citation. So I had originally drafted that a law enforcement officer could issue a citation in lieu of making a custody arrest of a suspect uh, in misdemeanor situations. Uh, the subcommittee liked it so well, they said, well, let's not just do it for misdemeanors, let's make it for all 
uh, crimes, including felonies, so that the law enforcement officer has this uh, discretion available to him. And uh, that's the way the committee passed it. And what has happened with some of these provisions that we have been working on, as Mark has said, for some time, which the legislature has considered perhaps extremely well taken, uh, those things have been already pulled out. And the legislature last session uh, took our provision on police citations and has already enacted that into law. Um, you know, sometimes I think uh, uh, court decisions are the product of personal experiences. And it was often said that in the Roshan case, uh, Justices Black and Douglas said that stomach pumping was a violation of uh, privilege against self-incrimination, uh, a, a broader kind of decision than, than the other judges had, had given that particular problem because they had had their stomachs pumped. Well, um, I had a young man call me a law student, and uh, he had been arrested by a small locality constable near Iowa City. And he called me. and. Uh, so I went to call him back, and I got a hold of the constable, and the constable said, well, he's had his one phone call. That's what he gets under the code. I said, yeah, I know he called me, and I'm going to call him back now. He said, no, he's had his one phone call. So there was a provision of the law that said uh, every accused person upon being taken into custody shall have one phone call, and that has now been changed to a reasonable number of calls. Uh, that's another change we've made, uh, maybe a little more minor one, but uh, I think uh, as I say, it's interesting sometimes your own experiences get into this. We have um, a couple of provisions that I think will make profound changes in the Iowa law and the procedure portion. Today, as you uh, may know, uh, a defendant cannot have a trial in a felony case other than before a jury. Now, we all agree, I think, that the right to a jury trial is a very important right. That should not be uh, uh, dispensed with. Uh, in any way, and it hasn't been in this new code revision. But there are situations sometimes where defendants don't want to be tried in front of juries. Quite often there's a crime that has aroused local or community passion, and the defendant would like to be tried before a judge alone, and uh, perhaps a little bit insulated, uh, depending on who the judge is, from sort of a tide of public emotion uh, in the community. Under the current Iowa Code, that defendant has no right, he cannot be, even in the, if the prosecutor and the judge and everybody agrees, he cannot be tried to a judge alone on a felony charge. So we have made a major change in our rules of criminal procedure, which are new under this uh, revised code, whereby a defendant can waive his jury trial and elect, if he wishes, to be tried by a judge alone. Now, we had a lot of discussion on this as to whether or not the prosecutor ought to be able to, to veto that decision. Because sometimes, you know, the prosecutor wants that trial before the jury. Uh, and uh, the committee in its wisdom decided, and I think it was a good decision, that the defendant, as a product of his own decision, and his alone, it can't be vetoed by a prosecutor, can elect to be tried before judge or jury. Now, you might think, well, uh, Professor, that's fine. But really, how many waivers of jury trials will you have? You know, won't most of the defendants want to be tried uh, to juries? Uh, and of course, there is, there is a value in having judge-only trials generally to the legal system in that they, they move along more rapidly. We can clear docket lag and court congestion and so forth. Well, in states which have a similar provision, like Maryland, for example, which has had it for a long time, we find that a majority of felony defendants elect to be tried to judges alone. So uh, to sort of answer my own question, it seems to me that if we follow the Maryland experience, and we well might, indeed, yes, it will have a great impact on our trial of cases here in that uh, a large number of defendants will probably elect to be tried by judges alone. We have incorporated another, I think, improvement in Iowa, tri uh, Iowa trial procedure. Sometimes in a complicated fraud or embezzlement or tax evasion case, uh, these things that go on for several days, uh, there are all kinds of figures being put on the blackboard and in charts by the lawyers and so forth and then erased off and uh, good heavens, the poor juror just really is in over his or her head trying to remember all of that stuff. And then, of course, at the end of the thing, they're supposed to decide if the defendant is really guilty of embezzlement or tax fraud or something. With nothing to look at. They go back to the jury room and one tries to remember it was this way, and no, the figure was that, and so forth. So we have included a provision which allows the jury 
uh, in, and I think it'll be especially important in these very complicated uh, cases involving figures uh, to take notes during the deliberations. Now, practice on that today is varied in Iowa. Uh, a few enlightened courts, uh, including Judge Donato's, allow the jurors to take notes. Some judges read the Iowa provision as barring note-taking by jurors. And I have been in trials where the judge has called both the attorneys to the bench, and you think something horrible is going to happen, and he says, uh, I notice Mrs. Smith in jury seat number six is taking notes. I'm instructing the bailiff as of now to go up and remove those from her, and they'll go up and take the notes away. And so uh, anyway, I think we've clarified that situation. Jurors will hereafter, uh, if and when this is passed, be allowed to take notes during jury trials. Well. Uh, I think that the criminal procedure portion of this 233 page package runs 150 pages. Obviously, I've covered about two of those for you in this little potpourri here, but maybe that'll give you some idea of the kinds of changes we tried to be cognizant of in revising this code. Mark. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I thought now we might uh, go into a couple of the specific, pro what I, uh, regarded as, as problem areas. Uh, Professor Yeager mentioned victimless crimes, and I believe described that well enough that I think we should just save on that, uh, save that for questions and pass on uh, to another, uh, another topic. Uh, one thing that has uh, aroused uh, civil liberties organizations around the, uh, around the country is a uh, somewhat more uh, recent emphasis on uh, preventive detention. Now this, uh, to, be, to be clear and to be fair, we should be clear that we're talking about authorized preventive uh, detention. I don't think there's much question but what the, the bail practices have been in, in many jurisdictions to, uh, in fact, uh, consider the possibility that an individual may commit another crime uh, while released, and uh, if that is suspected, uh, to make it at least much more difficult for that individual to be released on bail. Uh, the Bail Reform Act, uh, the Federal Bail Reform Act passed in I believe about 1966 and the Iowa Bail Reform Act passed shortly thereafter, made that somewhat more difficult to do uh, covertly and I think was partly responsible for uh, the, the overt efforts to authorize uh, preventive, uh, preventive detention. And there is a uh, a preventive detention proposal um, in this uh, in this proposed code. Uh, let me just for background uh, fill in just a little bit of, of what it provides for as I understand it. Uh, it would be limited uh, to people who are charged with the commission of forcible felonies. So it's uh, it's limited, would be limited to those uh, accused of more serious crimes. A forcible felony is defined as a, a homicide, a felonious assault, uh, sexual abuse, robbery, kidnapping, uh, or burglary. Uh, and uh, if a person is charged with one of those crimes and one of the following conditions are met, uh, then the person may be preventively detained. Um, the first one I regard as a little ba uh, vague. The state certifies by motion that based on such person's pattern of behavior consisting of his past and present conduct and on some other factors set out in the Bail Reform Act, uh, there is no condition or combination of conditions which will reasonably assure the safety of the community. Um, the second uh, alternative is if the person has committed another crime of violence which another forcible felony within the past 10 years, uh, or if the person uh, has threatened a, or injured uh, a juror or potential witness. Now that is a, um, in my view, a, a much less serious uh, kind of civil liberties problem. Uh, then the, the bill provides for uh, rather, uh, in my view, rather uh, good procedures uh, and then if, if the court makes certain findings of fact, uh, if the court may order uh, preventive detention for uh, a period of up to 40 days, although the, uh, the trial of such a person is to be ex expedited and presumably held uh, with in a shorter time than that if, uh, if possible. 
with that background, I thought we might ask, uh, I think, uh, uh, Professor Carlson and Representative Jesse to, to comment a little bit on, uh, uh, on the reasons why they thought that uh, was needed and what uh, civil liberties implications they may find uh, in there. Okay, fine, Mark. Um, well, let's, let's first of all decide, you know, what we're concerned about in putting in this kind of provision. Uh, first of all, we're concerned about the perversion of the bail system in Iowa, uh, which uh, reported to the committee uh, occurs in many places. Uh, if we have a dangerous suspect, what occurs today is bail is simply set high, and that suspect is not released. So he has a right to bail. That bail might be $100,000, but he has a right to bail, which is, in effect, no bail at all. And, of course, that particular defendant doesn't have to go through the various kinds of procedures uh, doesn't uh, obtain to the rights that are contained in our Chapter 12, which is this uh, new detention provision, where under he is entitled to a right to counsel, right to hearing, and all the rest of it. Uh, the judge in that other procedure, which presently operates in Iowa, just simply sets the bail at $100,000. Now, obviously, the kind of person we're concerned about here uh, is, and, and we think the bail law ought to be purified, we're concerned about uh, Let's take the Boston Strangler as an example, but we'll call him the Des Moines Strangler. Uh, somebody who has perhaps a pathological problem uh, and uh, commits a murder, but uh, he holds, holds a job in Des Moines and uh, uh, is regularly employed there, family roots and all the rest of it. Now, under the bail law, he would not be released on bail, uh, probably, uh, as a practical matter, but under the bail law, he is entitled to release and he should be released. Now, the fact that he's going to, you know, strangle more people while he's out on bail, uh, and uh, medical authorities would so state, uh, is not a ground for denying him bail. And so the committee decided there should be some limited pretrial detention of dangerous persons who are very likely to repeat offenses for which they've been arrested. That's the idea of this provision. Now, we do not take very lightly the restriction of pretrial freedom. So while taking away the rights to bail on certain classified dangerous offenders, we also try to give some rights, on the other hand, which are not available to other defendants. And those include the following. A right to a very, very speedy trial. Anybody who is incarcerated under the preventive detention statute, and let's make this very clear, because it's not like sort of Ireland uh, where, you know, people can be held for long periods of time without charge and trial. There's a special sort of statute of limitations here which requires the government to try the detained person within 40 days. After that time, the detention cannot be continued. Now, normally, uh, the speedy trial law operates uh, in 120 days, so you can see we've cut this down to one-third of that period for that special class of defendants that are detained before trial. The whole process has to be done in just slightly more than a month, so it's a very limited kind of detention. And let me say, that's part and parcel of one other thing that we've done to change the law here. The current statutes of, of Iowa allow another class of persons to be detained in an open-ended way. And those are people who are locked up as material witnesses to crimes. Under the current law, a person can be brought in for having done nothing wrong except to see a crime committed and then cooperate with the authorities and tell the authorities, this is what I saw. Pro Mr. Prosecutor can decide he is a material witness and the judge can set a bail and the particular witness involved can be held for a long, long period of time. Um, some of the examples include uh, the case of Warren versus Markwell County, uh, where the uh, witness, who again, as I say, had done nothing wrong but see a crime occur, was held for 97 days. Um, I myself represented four folks uh, who were carnival workers who had uh, seen a crime occur, reported to the authorities. Actually, one person on the carnival lot had broken a two by four over another one's head and killed uh, the second person. Uh, these four workers came to the authorities and said, this is what happened. Um, the prosecutor decided he needed them at the trial, uh, those witnesses, so they were locked up. And they had the hospitality of the Scott County, Iowa jail through June, July, and August. Meanwhile, the carnival moved on. 
Uh, one of my clients, a wife, had a baby while he was in there, couldn't get out for that. And if you know much about the lives of these people, they make their money during the summer. They live in Florida in the winter, and they make rather good money during the summer, but this is the time they have to do it. So these folks were all held in the Scott County Jail while their carnival co-workers were out in uh, Ontario and other places, you know, making their summer money. Now, the thing came to the end in, uh, in August when the defendant, uh, the two-by-four wielder, came up for trial, and he did what defendants often do. He said, I didn't really want that trial. After all, I plead guilty. So we brought our witnesses out of the jail, shook hands, and sent them on their way. A along the way, they had said, well, Mr. Carlson, can't we get, you know, at least the juror's fee or the witness's fee for each of these uh, 70 days that we were in the Scott County Jail? And I said, I'm sorry, that's already been ruled on in Iowa. Um, you get the fee for every day you're in attendance upon the court. And that means every day that you're a witness over in the courthouse, and since you weren't over there at all, uh, all of this time in the Scott County Jail is on the house, so the joke's on us. Um, th this, is, this is a terrible situation, and we have included in here to end such open-ended kinds of confinements of totally innocent people, uh, a provision uh, allowing only a very limited couple of days of detention in a facility separate from the general jail population, which these people were mixed in with, uh, where the prosecutor decides that he wants to take a deposition of a material witness, and then the material witness is released. Well, we, in the General Assembly, we frequently are called upon to uh, pass what we call legalizing acts. If a school board wants to issue bond issues and, uh, and fails to comply with the law so that the bond issue is not, uh, is not a legal one, then we pass a, an act that says, well, in spite of the fact that you didn't comply with the law, we're going to let you do it anyway and, uh, and legalize what, in essence, they have done. And, and this really is, um, this provision is, is really a kind of a legalizing act. At the, at the time of the Attorney General's conference on bail and criminal justice in 1964, um, the matter of preventive detention was, uh, was discussed at length, and, uh, and virtually all of the judges admitted that they did, in fact, um, engage in a kind of preventive detention that was really a prostitution of the, of the bail system and, the, and the, the reasons for requiring a person to post bail. Um, and I. The, the most, I think, that can be said for the preventive detention uh, provisions in this, in this criminal code uh, proposal is that, um, that it provides some guidelines for the exercise of otherwise illegal uh, actions on the part of courts and, um, and provides a, a means and a vehicle and a procedure whereby uh, bail can be denied when, in my opinion, uh, it really ought not to be, and there's no real justification for it. Of course, the, the judges are going to be concerned about, uh, and the prosecutors are going to be concerned about people who commit crimes while they're out on bail, but um, I, I think that, uh, that our Constitution and the traditional approach to bail has been that, uh, that bail cannot be denied. Uh, you, the, the purpose of bail traditionally has been um, the posting of, of security or uh, the imposition of conditions that will assure the presence of the defendant at the time that, that he is called for trial. And uh, preventive detention certainly does not come to grips with that problem. Rather, it speaks to the problem of, um, of the, the danger to society by having the person out on the streets. And this bill really just uh, provides some guidelines for its exercise. And to be sure, it does, uh, it does limit the exercise of, uh, of preventive detention to, to a very specialized group of crimes, of serious crimes. Um, and it does provide a hearing mechanism and, uh, and provide the grounds on which the, the judge can, can authorize preventive detention. Uh, 
but it, it isn't true, I believe, as I understand the present statutes, it is not true that, um, that a regular defendant who is not subject to uh, preventive detention is, does not have some of these same rights. He certainly does. If he, if he believes that his initial bail is set too high, he's entitled to, um, he's entitled to a review of that and he's entitled to a hearing in the same manner that, uh, that a hearing is provided in this situation. Uh, it may be that the procedures are not as, as definite um, nevertheless, he does have an opportunity to show that, um, uh, that he will be present at the time of his trial. Um, in short, I guess um, I really believe that, that a person is entitled to bail. I, I resist um, pretrial detention, and um, the best that can be said for this is that it just provides an orderly procedure for what judges are illegally doing now. Uh, just one comment of my own, and then I, maybe we should ask Judge Donato for uh, how, how this problem looks from behind the bench. Uh, on the level of principle, I guess I'm inclined to uh, agree with, uh, with uh, Representative Jesse. Uh, there's a, a pragmatic problem is, is always what's allowed. Well, uh, bail is fine, but uh, after all, a lot of these are dangerous people. Well. Uh, the District of Columbia has a, uh, such, a, uh, such a piece of legislation, preventive detention legislation, and they've done a good bit of study on, the, on this, and they found that something like 5% of those released uh, commit further crimes while they are released. Um, and uh, uh, that, uh, that is not, I suppose, an insignificant problem in a city like uh, Washington, D.C., uh, with the crime rate they have. Uh, one of the difficulties, though, is that uh, uh, the criteria that are set forth here uh, really don't seem to me very likely to, to help us predict which one in 20 of those, uh, of those incarcerated are likely to commit uh, that crime. The, the criteria that I indicated to you there in the bill are, are, are rather vague in that, uh, uh, in that respect. And as it happened, uh, for one reason or another, uh, the bill was actually invoked in the District of Columbia only a handful of times. Now that perhaps cuts both ways. It maybe suggests, on the one hand, that the need for it uh, was blown out of some proportion. Uh, it may also suggest that civil libertarians' concern about uh, abuse of it was, was blown out of some uh, proportion as well. Uh, Judge? Preventive detention is, uh, by its nature, extremely dangerous. What you're saying is that, uh, Defendant Smith, you are dangerous, therefore we will not allow you to be free pending your trial. Obviously, a conclusion that you're dangerous and you're likely to commit further crimes is tantamount to saying you committed this crime. You cannot have a fair trial after that. Now, this bill provides, of course, for secrecy on this hearing and its results and its conclusion, but there is no way that this can be maintained secret. In the first place, Secrecy in criminal proceedings runs against the grain of most judges. It does not run against mine, but it runs against the grain of most judges. Secondly, it will not pass the legislature in this form. They will not permit, the Iowa legislature will not permit this secrecy provision in here. If it passed this way, and if it were administered the way this bill is written, it would be good law. Theoretically, there can be the Boston Strangler who's deranged and would do more, uh, and he could be. Uh, properly and constitutionally detained pending an early uh, an earlier trial, but those are rare cases, and uh, this uh, I think if this provision goes to the legislature, it will be changed, and uh, consequently I, I look for uh, potential disaster in it. Uh, the only thing that can save you from this sort of a law is a uh, what shall I say a very uh, enlightened judiciary exercising its inherent power to ensure a fair trial, whether it's really required by the law or not. And frankly, I don't think that we have a judiciary that has that basic uh, view in their makeup regarding the average criminal defendant in the state of Iowa. So as a practical matter, I'm opposed to it. As a theoretical matter, I think this law is extremely well written. Professor Carlson wrote it, 
there are new provisions in it that have not been tried elsewhere. I think they're excellent. If the law were passed this way and if it were administered this way, I think I would not have anything to fear of it. But as a practical matter, I fear it greatly. Thank you, Judge. I think that... Uh... Mark, I, I have one more comment, and that is that, uh, that the Boston Strangler thing is, a, is the kind of, the kind of uh, demagogic uh, uh, approach that is used so often in the General Assembly to pass, uh, to pass law and order legislation. We can deal with the Boston Strangler today without denying bail. We can deal with that problem. We can institutionalize someone who is mentally deranged presently and outside of the criminal system with, with numerous safeguards that, that go to the, to the problem of the mental derangement and not to the, to the uh, presumption that he has committed the crime that he is charged with. Um, and I, I just think that you can deal with those mentally deranged people um, without having a preventive detention law that goes to the, to the heart of the bail situation. I think uh, uh, this, uh, this, this last discussion illustrates that the, uh, the committee sessions on some of these things were, uh, were quite lively indeed, and that they uh, uh, gave some of these matters some rather, rather thorough and, uh, and possibly heated debate. I would like to spend just a, a few minutes on sentencing before we open it up uh, uh, to questions. Um, this is a topic that really has not been uh, the focus of uh, organizations like the Civil Liberties Union uh, through the years, I think. Uh, but it is something that uh, uh, particularly the American Civil Liberties Union Prisoners' Rights Project and so forth are uh, uh, beginning to focus upon. One of the principal complaints that, uh, that one hears in the literature and that I've found in uh, my own limited dealing with inmates is that one of the things that they object to most of all about the current administration of the criminal justice system is the uncertainty of just what uh, they are going to be asked to do, uh, how much time in particular uh, they are going to be asked to be served, what they have to do to remain on probation, uh, what they have to do to get uh, parole. Uh, most of these matters are highly discretionary, almost no law on the, uh, on the subject, uh, although that is uh, beginning to change. Uh, with that uh, comment, let me uh, describe uh, just generally what I see uh, as the fundamental structure proposed for sentencing in Iowa. Uh, the, the basic part of it is unchanged, with, uh, but there are some additions uh, and uh, some other changes. The basic approach is to continue indeterminate sentencing. Uh, now, by indeterminate sentencing, I mean that in almost all cases, there are exceptions to this, uh, the judge's choice is between probation or incarceration. Uh, if the judge sentences to prison, the judge has nothing further to say about how much time the sentence is up to the maximum proposed uh, allowed by uh, statute. And from that point on, uh, the parole board decides how much time uh, the individual will actually do when the person is ready for release, to put it uh, somewhat differently. Uh, now, this, this code does uh, substantially reduce uh, the, author, the legislative authorized sentences for uh, uh, many, uh, many crimes, which is a, a move that's been widely urged, I think, by the commentators. Uh, the parole board is not changed uh, very much. There is some a provision for staff at the institutions, which is surely uh, desirable. But the people, it, we still have a lay parole board with, in my view, the most general kinds of guidelines determining when a person uh, is to be uh, released. The other uh, new provision is a special sentencing provision for uh, dangerous offenders. Uh, now, this, this particularly, I think, has some civil liberties uh, implications. Uh, uh, basically, it means that the doctors at the uh, Iowa, medical, Iowa Security Medical Facility in Oakdale, I take it it would be, uh, determine who has a personality dangerously disposed to physical violence. Uh, 
uh, let me, I, I may not have made that exactly clear. A person who has committed a, uh, felonies are divided into A, B, C, and D felonies. Uh, an A felony is, is basically first degree murder and I believe first degree sexual abuse. That's life imprisonment. Uh, then uh, there are B, C, and D felonies. I think C is 10 years maximum and D is five years. All class B felonies are, are B, uh, are, B are subject to uh, uh, punishment as dangerous offenders and that's 20 years. Also, C and D offenders who are regarded as dangerous, that is who doctors have determined have a personality dangerously predisposed to physical violence uh, may be incarcerated for that additional period as a uh, dangerous offender. I'm not sure I've made that perfectly clear. I'll let uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Professor Yeager and Judge Bonato explain it. Uh, the civil liberties problems are one, the standard is, is somewhat vague. I am not sure that, that doctors really have good concrete operational uh, ways of, of making those determinations. And of course, it, it's arguable at least that this is uh, convicting someone for an additional crime without uh, a jury, uh, a jury trial. Uh, comments on sentencing uh, generally, and if, if you desire on that provision in uh, particular, Professor Yeager. It's not quite uh, turning the matter over to the doctors in this case. It's a matter of uh, making the determination first and then getting the doctors to go along with this uh, classification. Um, that, that is as a, as a second opinion, you might say, because first, uh, well, we, we talk about these Class B felonies, uh, felons as being dangerous offenders. Uh, these are um, the felonies which, under our present code, are considered as the most uh, serious, that is short of actual first degree murder, uh, the most serious types of, hom of uh, felonies. Your second degree homicide, for example, attempted homicide, um, kidnapping, first degree kidnapping that is, uh, first degree robbery, uh, first degree arson, and uh, first degree burglary. All of these in, uh, uh, crimes are crimes which not only, um, well they all incorporate some serious uh, um, threats to, to uh, uh, human life and safety uh, because of um, just, just the, the nature of the activity itself. Uh, the activity which pretty well demonstrates that this is the type of a person who, well, for example, a, a, a robber, a person convicted of first degree robbery is pretty well established that he is going to take your wallet and if he has to kill you to do it, he's gonna kill you to do it. And that's, that's the type of person that we're dealing with here. Now, as far as the, the other, the, um, classification, the uh, persons who have committed less serious felonies, you first have to show that their conduct, not only in committing this felony, but also their past conduct and uh, maybe conduct before and after this, um, is characterized by a pattern of repetitive or compulsive behavior which endangers the life or physical well-being of others or by aggressive behavior with heedless indifference to consequences. And this has to be established as a fact, matter of fact, just like for the proof of the crime itself. But not for, by the jury. Yes. Yes, this is a fact question. For the jury. Well, I think it would be, wouldn't it? As I remember, it is not. Well, I don't know that we have said here one way or the other. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fact question. And then, once we have decided, yeah, this, this guy looks like a really dangerous offender, then you send him down to Oakdale or, or some other um, mental facility and let them uh, run a psychological evaluation on him. And if that doesn't support, if, if their uh, conclusions do not support your su suspicions or your findings, well, then uh, he cannot be so classified. on that or maybe on the how you feel about indeterminate sentencing in general and the uncertainty that that creates. I frankly uh, have some question about our dangerous offender uh, uh, approach. 
but on the indeterminate sentence matter, if you are at all familiar with the present Iowa law, it's my recollection that we do not change the concept greatly, and I approve of not changing the concept greatly. With some exceptions, the Iowa law is now that you shall be sentenced to a term not to exceed X years, depending upon the crime. Now it'll be depending upon the class of felony, A, B, C, or D. Uh, let's say five years, for example. From that point on, of course, the parole board determines when release is appropriate uh, to that case. That is the law now, and that uh, concept is continued uh, under the new law, and I heartily approve of it myself. John, did you? Yes. Uh, as, was point, as Mr. Shantz himself pointed out, it's apparent that although the committee generally was in general agreement, I can't remember a particular substantial issue which uh, achieved unanimous support in the committee. Everything was fought out. And if politics has been defined as the art of the possible, certainly this was in each case a political decision, not partisan, but as a result of compromise. Accordingly, I don't think anybody on the committee or anybody who worked with the committee is entirely satisfied with the bill as to each particular provision. For instance, I have disagreement with the concept that an 11 to 1 verdict is sufficient for a finding of guilty. I have certain disagreement with the incest statute provisions, but I have extreme disagreement with the Dangerous Offender Act. And I'd like to clear up what may be some misconceptions. It may very well be, as Professor Yeager and Judge Donato have said, that the way it will be applied will be such as to not infringe upon a person's civil liberties. The way it's written, however, clearly, I say, does. For instance, though whether or not it's an issue of fact for the judge to determine whether the individual is, has, quote, aggressive behavior with heedless indifference to consequences, the fact is that it is the judge's decision and solely the judge's decision. This decision may be based on a number of things, including a confidential pre-sentencing report, which the defendant is not required to be given. The judge may keep this confidential. So the individual may never know why, when he pled guilty, say, for a, to a five-year offense, he finds himself sentenced to 20 years. Further, there has been a comment to the extent that the, or to the belief that the Iowa Security Medical Facility has, an, has a veto, in essence, over the judge's finding of fact. But this is not borne out in the statute. The only requirement is that the individual be sent there for a report, and that report is to be considered by the judge as evidence, but not conclusive. The facility may come back and say, this man is not a dangerous offender. It is not binding on the judge to buy that report. Now, there are two types of, of increased sentence provisions in the code. One's the incorrigible offender. Let's take a look at that and compare it to the dangerous offender provision. The incorrigible offender is, in essence, a repeater. He has a prior history of uh, at least two convictions of a class C or D felony prior to the felony which he is then convicted. In other words, at this point, he's had three felony convictions. Now, the procedural safeguards set about before a person can be convicted as an incorrigible offender are very strong. For instance, it must be charged in the indictment that he has previous offenses. The previous offenses must be set out. The individual, the defendant, has a right to a jury trial on that issue, whether or not he was the person who committed these offenses. Absolutely. It's out in the open. He knows what evidence is being relied on. He has the right to rebut. And the delineation is specifically set out. Two or more convictions, prior convictions of a felony. On the other hand, look at the, look at the standard for, getting, for uh, labeling a person a dangerous offender. The judge may find that the individual has aggressive behavior with heedless indifference to consequences, whatever that may be. He may base this on information which is not available to the defendant, which the defendant has no right to see, which the defendant accordingly will find very difficult to rebut. The judge can go beyond the expert opinion of the medical facility, which says the individual is not a dangerous offender. And more important, the individual may not even know he's being considered as a dangerous offender, except for his visit to the medical facility, which could very well be incorporated as a, as a concomitant of many offenses, until such time as the judge says, I find you a dangerous offender 20 years. But judge, I only pled guilty to a five-year offense. He's lost. My contention is that clearly, if you're going to have a dangerous offender type act, one, you've got to allow the accused to be put on notice that he is being considered as a dangerous offender. 
Secondly, he has to have the right to know what evidence is being considered to prove the charge. And thirdly, he ought to, he has to have the right to rebut it. Fourth, he ought to have the right to a jury trial on this issue. So uh, if, you, if there appears to be a slight difference of opinion as to how this is going to work or what its provisions are, uh, you've gotten a, a brief glimpse of what went on almost every Saturday, or every Friday rather, in Des Moines while this package was being debated. I would uh, once again like to take the other uh, position here. This uh, dangerous offender provision was included in the code only after a considerable discussion as to just how you would go about proving this. And it was uh, the general consensus of the subcommittee that uh, put this provision in the code that you would prove a person to be a dangerous offender in the same way that you would prove him to be an incorrigible offender. And if we use the same procedure in both cases, that will take care of everything that Mr. Tim has uh, raised there. It will have to be in the indictment, and it will uh, have to be established as a matter of fact. The difficulty I don't think it will it'll, uh, stand uh, constitutional scrutiny unless you do that. The problem is that that is not incorporated in the, in the rules on pleading. Uh, I tend to agree that if it were handled the same way that incorrigible offender question is handled, it probably would pass constitutional muster and it probably also would not infringe upon personal rights and liberties. The problem is, as written, it does not include this provision. I, this is probably a drafting problem, but the concepts certainly are different. All right, I, I think we ought to take some time for some questions. Uh, I want to make sure you don't feel, uh, you can pursue some of the matters we've opened up, but don't in any way feel uh, uh, restricted to these uh, topics. I think we've got expertise here on anything that might be or uh, uh, was included in the code. Yes.
one of them, sir, and one of them is a parole violator that was sentenced actually in box cars, <laughs> and yet neither one of them was in uh, Fort Madison for, uh, none of them were in Fort Madison for longer than 18 months. Now why have these incredibly long sentences set up this procedure for uh, incorrigible offenders when the whole trend in corrections, halfway house regional detention facility, so on, is going exactly the opposite? This uh, code was put together uh, with the assistance of the personnel who are running the penal institutions, um, with the assistance of the parole board, uh, with the uh, consultation with the, well, the number of the operators of halfway houses, and uh, if uh, if the code does not incorporate many of their ideas on corrections, uh, I don't, uh, I don't really know how that could be possible. Now, as far as the long sentences are concerned, it's true that most people get out of Anamosa in about 18 months, um, but not everybody. Uh, there are some people who serve their whole time, and. Uh, the theory, the basic theory here is that the, uh, if you're running a, a, a correctional system which concentrates on reformation, on rehabilitation of the individual, you should turn him loose as soon as he's re rehabilitated. So the, the, the um, and if that is done, then the, the far end of the sentence really is uh, pretty irrelevant. Uh, the point is that you keep him there as long as it's necessary to do the job, and then you turn him loose. Now, we had toyed around with the idea of the um, purely indeterminate sentence, that is, the, um, uh, the sentence with no maximum. However, we have the idea that uh, for, say, a Class D felony, even the most incorrigible Class D felon ought not be kept locked up for more than five years, because what he did is just not, not that serious. Uh, I disagree with what you said about our flying in the face of uh, correctional philosophy. Can I comment on that? Please. There are a lot of other provisions. First of all, you've got to realize that there are, we do retain provisions for deferred sentencing, or we specifically make provision for deferred sentencing, which was ruled unconstitutional a little while ago, without such provisions. We further make provisions that local correctional programs, such as halfway houses and the like, may be utilized even by felons, not limited to misdemeanors, prior to being sentenced. In other words, you can put him in deferred sentencing and send him to one of these houses. You only order confinement under very strict uh, consideration under the code. I think clearly that this is a much more liberal approach to sentencing than the present one. Mark, that's essentially what I wanted to say. That when you discuss only the dangerous offender concept, uh, you, you distort the overall view of the sentencing procedure. It's really not that bad. We have provided, uh, we've provided virtually every technique for uh, the vehicle, at least, for every technique for, um, for avoiding the incarceration. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, <clears throat> Overall, the sentences have have uh, been substantially reduced. It is tempered by the fact that we have uh, um, we have removed the the good time and the honor time provision, uh, principally at the request of the institutional personnel who who feel that it's caused them problems, um, and so that tends to lengthen the sentence. What used to be a ten year sentence could be served in four years, eight months, and nineteen days flat. And, um, and we make that a five-year sentence, and so you're right back where, <laughs> where you start. Except that we have made, uh, we have changed the category of what have been thought to be felonies, so that um, many of the things that have been felonies heretofore are not presently felonies. Um, the, the larceny is the prime example of that.
Course yeah, and then the institution or uh, my commitments for which no party has ever granted to this organization. Uh, We're trying to keep a so, secret. Uh, why, why not recognize the fact that these sentences just aren't served? And that rehabilitation doesn't take place after 10 years. It's going to take place, it's going to take place after 15 months or 24 months, perhaps, which is, which is what the form the city was telling us now is correct. We're trying to keep that a secret from the General Assembly because they. They'd like for them to stay there longer. Uh, I realize that, but it still seems to me that the bill ought to reflect uh, reality. These are compromised figures, of course. You should be aware that there are those who wanted the figures to be a hell of a lot higher than they are. I'd like to question the concept of, of making a psychiatrist uh, the final arbiter on this dangerous uh, criminal business. After somebody has been convicted, after they've been a judge, uh, a uh, potential uh, offender again, and you send them to a psychiatrist to say, you know, is he or isn't he, are we right? It's going to be a pretty brave psychiatrist who says, no, it's all right. Uh, he's pretty much going to go along with the general uh, uh, opinion of what's gone before. And it seems to me that this is really uh, just adding um, some uh, force to, uh, for the court to, to back up on, but I don't think that it really adds any extra <coughs> It, it's not clear whether or not this is supposed to happen before uh, this or not all, uh, from the bill. Now, uh, Professor Yeager, I think, indicated that, that the, the psychiatrist role would be, as you suggest, confirmatory or, uh, uh, or not of the, uh, of the previous findings. Well, he hasn't got the decision to make. He simply puts in his evidence along with everybody else's the way things are set up right now. The alternative would be not to consult a psychiatrist, and I don't think that would be a very good idea either. I'd like to point out one more thing with regard to these length of sentences. Um, we have uh, uh, set up a, a sort of a, a, a schedule or a checklist uh, for the judge to go through in sentencing any offender. And, and uh, we have provided that he ought to consider these alternatives in this order. First, he should consider whether he ought to defer the judgment and sentence for an indefinite period and uh, let this man out on uh, under the supervision of a pro parole or probation officer um, with the thought that if he makes good on probation, we'll just uh, uh, drop the whole matter right there and he will not even have a conviction on his record. Now the second thing, uh, if he decides that that's not a good idea, then the second thing that he ought to consider here is um, uh, to um, Wait a minute, I got the wrong section here. Um, impose a fine. Yeah, the second thing you ought to consider is a fine wherever that would be appropriate. And of course, in most of these felony cases, that would not be appropriate. Then the third thing you ought to consider here is to uh, pass sentence, enter the judgment against this man, pass sentence, and then uh, put, him, um, uh, put him on parole, suspend the sentence for a while. And then uh, the last, uh, last resort, if he, if he rules out everything else, is to um, sentence the man to uh, a term of confinement. Now, the result of this is going to be that, that is, if it is administered in the way that we uh, intend for it to be administered, the result of this will be that the man who goes to the penitentiary is going to be a fairly hard case. Um, in which case the, the longer possible terms, I think, can uh, be more justified. We also have shock probation. We, yeah, we also have the shock probation idea. You send him down to the, the uh, penitentiary with a 20-year sentence hanging over his head, and then after 60 days, bring him back and say, how do you like it? And he says, not very well. And uh, then you say, well, we'll put you on probation now, and if you if you uh, straighten up and act right, why, you can stay out. If you uh, fall back into your evil ways, why, back you go. We hope that'll work, especially with the young, uh, young kids that get run in on robbery charges and so forth.
Good. Okay, now the second one would be in John's bailiwick, but I will answer the first one, and that is an excellent question. Um, just to give uh, everybody the lawyer's parlance here, we're talking in the area of discovery by criminal defendants of the government's case. And, uh, you know, the problem with State versus Eads is the problem you have with Miranda versus Arizona. Let me just digress over to that, and then I'll come back to answer the question. Uh, everybody should know uh, especially everybody in law enforcement ought to know that when you arrest a person and before you interrogate them, you tell them you have a right to a lawyer and Mr. Defendant, if you can't afford one, will appoint one. Anything you say can be used against you and uh, you have a right to silence. Uh, the problem is in some of the areas of Iowa, the Supreme Court of the United States advance sheets are not available. So uh, I viewed the procedural portions of the code not only as sort of writing good law, but maybe a teaching device, say, because I figure, well, uh, ye old constable may not have the Supreme Court advance sheets, but at least he's, he's got the good old cold of Iowa volume two there, and when he makes an arrest, he kind of looks through there to see what he ought to do. So I had written into the law that after arrest uh, and prior to interrogation, a subject shall be told the following things, and put that in in, in the statute. Uh, with. The other members of the committee to my right voting with me, we lost, uh, I think by one vote. Uh, but I did have the support of those gentlemen who are here. Uh, I, you know, I think sometimes it's good to get these things uniform, put into statutory law, so that everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Now we come back to criminal discovery. Um, we do have the case of State versus Eads that the questioner has mentioned here. State versus Eads provides uh, really some guidelines where they uniformly applied by judges around Iowa and instead of being discretionary made mandatory that, that would be pretty good. It allows a criminal defendant prior to trial to learn certain things that the government has. The results of scientific reports, ballistics on bullets that may have been involved in the crime, uh, blood analysis, things like this. And of course the, the modern notion in trials is that you shouldn't have at a sporting contest, go to the trial and have complete surprise. Rather, there ought to be an opportunity for the various sides before trial to find out a little bit about what the other side has by way of investigation and so forth. So we have written a brand new rule now, uh, unknown uh, to the prior Iowa law, which gives the defendant the right to discover on his motion certain things. If the uh, state took a confession of the defendant, the defendant's entitled to a copy of that. Uh, if uh, the government has subjected certain physical items in the case, uh, just examples that I have mentioned here, ballistic test or paraffin test, various things like that, to examination by the FBI lab in Washington or the BCI lab in Des Moines, again, our defendant is entitled to copies of these various things. So we have made uniform, and basically non-discretionary, uh, available to the defendant, uh, several items uh, that the prosecutor will have, which we think it's right for the defendant to see before trial to prepare himself for trial. John, there was a second question there on... Uh, what about deposition? Um, I, we have not provided for dep deposing government witnesses. No, that was debated and rejected. Is there anything else on the discovery thing or? Okay, good. John, there was a second question there. Uh. As far as these sex crimes are concerned, we have generally treated both, uh, well, let's call them normal and deviant sex activities for one of a better term. Uh, we have treated these as being the, uh, the same thing. So uh, uh, homosexual uh, activity, is criminal under the same circumstances as normal heterosexual activity would be criminal. In other words, for, uh, in forcible situations, uh, the homosexual rape is treated just like the uh, good old-fashioned kind, and um, the um, uh, homosexual activities with children are treated in the same way as uh, uh, normal sex activities with children. As far as um, adultery is concerned, uh, we have made no reference at all to that. 
Um, it's um, really um, uh, the, the type of, well, our present statute is, is designed simply to give somebody a uh, club to beat his, uh, his uh, husband or wife over the head with. And uh, we did not think that that should be continued here. As far as incest is concerned, uh, I think you have to realize that what you're dealing with in almost all incest prosecutions is um, a um, father and a 14-year-old daughter or, or uh, something, 12-year-old daughter or something like that. That's almost the only kind of incest that ever comes to anybody's attention. Um, there are some other kinds, I suppose, that uh, might be prosecuted, but generally this is what you're dealing with. More often than not, you're dealing with stepdaughters. That seems to be the real explosive situation. Um, bigamy, we've, uh, we actually considered not uh, including bigamy in the code, uh, the argument being that with our easy uh, dissolution of marriage now, a person can have an indefinite number of uh, husbands or wives um, during his lifetime, as long as he stops and gets uh, the marriage, uh, each marriage dissolved before he contracts another one, uh, why should we get so excited just because he happens to wind up with two at the same time? <laughs> um, uh, however, the, once again, this is a, as we say, uh, a compromise. We put the uh, code together that we thought would get passed and we did not think we could leave this out. Say, uh, Fred's question, if I could just put a footnote on that discovery thing, raises one thing that I'd like to maybe put a bug in Norm's ear about, uh, which uh, if the opportunity comes to reinstate Norm, I think this might be a real interesting one to add in. One thing I did have, Fred, on the discovery as a matter of the original draft was that automatically in a criminal case, the government would give the defense uh, with no hassles, you know, just upon request, uh, the record, criminal record, of any government witness uh, to testify in the case, you know, which normally the defendant has a very limited means to get at that. Now, the government can get that very easily, just have an FBI run done. You as defense counsel can't get that. So I had put in there that as a matter of uh, simply request and write in every case uh, where the defendant wanted it, uh, the prosecutor would turn over whatever record he had for impeachment purposes of any government uh, witnesses, which, as you know, you, you really have to sweat to find that stuff. Uh, it seemed to me that was a perfect kind of thing that you make discoverable. It's something very helpful to the defense, something they'd like to know about. It's easily available to the government. Why not just make that turnover as a matter of routine? Um, that, as I say, did not prevail in the final draft, but it's, that's one I would be interested in seeing reinstated. I could make one, put a footnote to the uh, sexual offenses. With the exception of incest, uh, acts between consenting adults and or animals are not treated as criminal in this code. If that, so the, I don't think we've used either term, have we? Yeah. Where? Any person having a living husband or wife who marries another is the way the bigamy statute is read, written. Well, but other places it's... Um, I think uh, Louise is referring to the current code which uses the terminology she's referring to. I think you'll find a lot of other errors in uh, there too, the Louise. <laughs> That's not in the uh, final draft, so that, that particular phrase. Somebody, I, we did, I think, I'm, oh, well, with respect to the, uh, the sex crimes that you mentioned, uh, it, it'll be easier for you to understand it if you understand that we approached the, the subject of sex crimes in terms of assaults. And so you don't have to deal with, with sodomy and, and some of those consensual problems um, head on. You just deal with them in terms of assaults, and uh, and you avoid all the hassle. So, oh, but I want to say something about discovery because that, that one of the practical problems that we had to deal with is that um, the committee, as it was originally composed, had a liberal chairman, 
and was, I think, fairly well balanced in terms of, of competing interests in, in, in the area of criminal law. Um, re regrettably, the chairman was defeated at the, uh, at the next election. And uh, Bob Kramer from Des Moines was appointed chairman, and, uh, and in my opinion, Bob Kramer is a throwback in terms of, uh, of criminal law. And, uh, and Bob Kramer proceeded to stack the committee so that many of the things that, that I had thought we were going to be successful in getting done were not done, because it was stacked with prosecutors and, uh, and conservatives and people of that general ilk. And, uh, <laughs> And so the, the discovery problem is really acute because, um, because Ron, uh, I've discussed this with him before, Ron has a very orderly mind and, uh, and much of what we did in the area of procedure is done for administrative convenience. We have done away with, in my opinion, preliminary hearings altogether. And so even the discovery that has heretofore been provided through the vehicle of a preliminary hearing is no longer available. And, uh, and, the, and the quid pro quo for doing away with preliminary hearings is to have discovery, and we didn't get that either. And uh, we just, in my opinion, had a, a, a number of difficulties with, in that area because by the time we got to the final decisions, the committee had been so stacked that we didn't have a chance. Uh, another problem that I'd like to point out is that uh, that when we approached... Norman, you get to talk on the floor all the time. Uh, you shouldn't uh, hold the stand here. <laughs> we approached many areas of this law. The no-knock, administrative searches, uh, the, um, the whole gamut. We approached not from the philosophy, in my opinion, that it was, it was good philosophy or good law, but rather we, we legalized and formalized uh, virtually every police practice that the Supreme Court has said is not clearly forbidden by the Constitution. And that is another quarrel I have. I've been indicated, I've uh, been asked to restrict this to one more uh, question. I think Mr. Allen has had his hand up for some time. Yes, I'd like to know whether anything is done about the criminal syndicalism. About what? The criminal criminal syndicalism. Well, I believe that was uh, out. It's, it's not in there. Order. Not in there. It's not as got another gentleman here if you can take one more. It's, it's gone. All right. All right, one more, John. All right, a quick one on uh, the options that are available to a prosecutor. Uh, Dr. Yeager mentioned that there are 60 different uh, concepts of theft in the present law. Very frequently, when a case involving a motor vehicle comes before a judge, and particularly the prosecutor, uh, he looks at the thing, and here's one law that says larceny of a motor vehicle or uh, taking the automobile without the driver's permission. Mm -hmm. So that right away you have options. You have a number of these carry-ins on down the line, which gives rise to a complete copy. Now, uh, has the committee considered this, and have they kind of obviated some of these obvious distortions where you go one way or the other at the discretion of the county attorney? I talked to our county attorney and expressed my theory that he probably exercises more judgment in criminal proceedings than all the judges in the district court in our judicial district, and he smiled and said that's true, and by considerable. I suggest the same theory to my criminal law class. That, that was neither a short question nor one that can be answered <laughs> shortly, John, but I'll give somebody a crack at that. Uh, the plea bargaining thing, do you want me to mention on that? What we you can talk about, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, uh, this is, uh, plea bargaining is a hot issue today, and, and this is an important point. One thing uh, that we did do here, uh, we do have a new rule of criminal procedure now, whereby uh, to avoid defendants saying later on, gee, I was promised this and they didn't do it, uh, we did feel that all of this ought to be brought out in the open, and we require under a new Rule 9 plea bargaining, the prosecutor to disclose uh, his agreements, uh, what he said he's going to do, uh, all the various uh, pretrial negotiations that went into uh, the defendant standing up there and pleading guilty. And as I say, again, we formalize that into a rule which requires uh, all of that sort of backroom stuff now to be brought out, put on the record, uh, with the court reporter taking it down. Yeah. I think um, we have to recognize one thing, and that is that the criminal code is not self-executing that um, 
If you put good men in there to administer it, conscientious men, it will be administered one way, and if you put uh, another type of man in there, it will be administered the other way, and that's true whether you're talking about the prosecutor, the judge, or defense attorney, or what it, uh, uh, who it is. As far as, uh, as uh, the theft problem is concerned, though, it, it's uh, not a question of uh, discretion. Um, Motor vehicle theft and operating a motor vehicle without the owner's consent are two quite different things. Um, and when I talk about the 30 to 60 different kinds of theft in there, I'm talking about the fact that the theft law is so extremely detailed. Uh, you have uh, a crime called knocking fruit off in the daytime, and then another one called knocking fruit off in the nighttime. And, uh, and then you have an embezzlement by a public officer, and an embezzlement by a bailee, and an embezzlement by um, this, that, and the other person. Um, it's, it's too detailed. You could have one theft law that would cover all kinds of uh, uh, thefts of fruit. Uh, it doesn't make any difference whether he knocks it off the tree or steals it off the stand, and they uh, think it shouldn't anyhow. And as far as embezzlement is concerned, what's the difference uh, whether he's a public officer or a bailee or an agent or an attorney or what he is? He's done the same thing. So, so what we uh, have done there is, I suppose, cut down on not the discretion but on the um, necessity of the prosecutor deciding which of these uh, many things that uh, he should work with. As a matter of practice, most prosecutors have in mind, I think, three or four of, of these theft laws, and they use them, and uh, they ignore the rest of them. Thank you. I, uh, we've got to cut it off. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for uh, taking the time and trouble to be with us. I'd like to thank the audience for the, uh, uh, the good questions. Uh, uh, as you can tell, we, we really have just barely uh, scratched the surface. Uh, and. Uh, I'm not sure we've even done it in a, uh, uh, in a, in a balanced, uh, objective way, uh, nor do I'm sure we could have, but uh, I hope at least that we've uh, triggered a little more interest, got some sense of the magnitude and, uh, and significance of this uh, proposed uh, uh, legislation. I've been asked to announce that you can find your lunch by going out past the registration desk to the Campanile Room. Thank you.